Good evening and welcome to the Arundel Camera Club live stream for Wednesday, November 11th, 2020. My name is John Milliker and I'm the club president for the 2020-2021 season. The Arundel Camera Club was founded in 1957 and exists to promote the art, science, and education in all aspects and fields of photography. Normally we meet at 7 p.m. every Wednesday evening during the school year in Severna Park, Maryland. However, with the current disruptions, we've decided to continue business as normal in a virtual space which allows us to protect our members and guests from the current COVID-19 situation. For more information about us, please visit www.arundelcameraclub.org. Before we get to tonight's topic, we have a few announcements and upcoming schedules items to cover. On Wednesday, November 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern, we have a photo competition. This is color and monochrome digital with an open theme. Keep an eye out for an email from our contest chair, Lewis, for instructions. And if you have questions about competitions and submitting your own photos, please see our website. Contact Lewis at contests at arundelcameraclub.org or ask here on our group. Thursday, November 19th is our rescheduled Brian Baru fundraiser. That is from 4 to 9 p.m. They will have takeout available. Please check out an email from Michelle that either has come out or will come out regarding how to do the takeout or any current uh, issues with uh, seating in the, the restaurant, which is kind of unfolding daily. So, uh, so keep an eye out on our Facebook page and our email list for that. We have no meeting on Thanksgiving, November 25th. But photo assignments are due by 6 p.m., please. And that is the photo assignment for baking and cooking. On December 2nd, 2020, we will have the photo assignment for the program of baking and cooking and announce the winner on our Facebook group who got the most votes. December 9th is our uh, digital photography contest with the theme of leading lines. And we have some unfortunate bad news because of uh, everything that's been going on with, uh, with, current, uh, with COVID coming back a little bit. Uh, we have decided, unfortunately, to cancel our Christmas party for December 16th. We are planning on, uh, on something virtual that evening, but we haven't really fleshed that out yet. And we will let you guys know as soon as we can. On the uh, December 23rd, there is no meeting due to Christmas. We're lucky to have Greg hold. Let me bring Greg up here on the on the screen. Let me move a couple things around and bring Greg up on the screen. There we go. Hello, Greg. How are you? Howdy. Hello we're, from Colorado. Yeah, we're lucky to have Greg Holden with us. He is a photographer from Denver, Colorado, who uses photography to share with others how he sees the world. Greg is an avid hiker, and while most of his photos are from visits to national parks, some of his best photos are from outings closer to home. Although Greg has enjoyed photographing many beautiful sunrises and grand landscapes, he finds that the little scenes often overlooked by others are the ones that really fuel his creativity. Greg enjoys teaching others and sharing his passion for photography, and prior to moving to Colorado in 2019, was a regular speaker and judge at clubs throughout Maryland, Virginia area, and taught at Capitol Photography Center in D.C. You can see Greg's work on his website at www.imagesunderfoot.com. Greg, I've got some fun facts about you here. Do we want to move through these together? Uh, sure. I've sure. Got, go ahead and share those. I've got Greg moved to Denver, Colorado in 2019 and works as an aerospace engineer at Ball Aerospace. And you say this is the same company as Ball Char Canning Corporation. That's correct. Same same stock. So so we're benefiting from all the aluminum aluminum cans and aluminum cups that are coming out nowadays. Please tell me that they use some of the ball jars in their aerospace program. They no, they do not. And actually, Ball Corporation does no longer produces the Ball Mason jars. Um, they are still produced by another company, and they license our logo. Wow! Okay. Um, we we are the number one um, canning and packaging company in the entire world, and I think we're one of the biggest producers of aluminum uh, cans. So, uh, with think of uh, aerosol cans and other food canning and all that stuff. And then Ball Aerospace, which I work for, um, is just a small portion of that of that corporation. Wow, that's interesting. But uh, we got to start with ball jars, and then <laughs> from glass we went to optics, and from optics we went to sensors, and then aerospace uh, is now rapidly approaching a, a, a big, big uh, share of that stock value by um, all, all the business we're bringing in. Wow. Doubled our workforce in the last two years. What a jump. Greg, I also see you have over 100 books on and about photography, but less than 10% of them are about camera instruction. You have portfolios of well-known photographers from the early to mid-1900s, such as Stieglitz, uh, Minor White, uh, Elliot Porter, Man Ray, and Maryland native 
Aubrey, a Aubrey Bodine. Mm -hmm. What is the importance in, in, uh, for, for people that may just be technical, like, like me, I'm kind of a, one of those technical book people. Um, what is, uh, why is it so important to get portfolios of, of photographers that, that you, in, that, that you uh, appreciate their work in? Yeah. Cause I, I think when you, the, the educational books are great when you first start out and I definitely, uh, had my share of them, uh, when I first started out. But I think as you as you go on in your photography, you, you start to realize that the technology and the, the instruction part of it, it starts to become less important. I think you, we each get to a certain place in our in our technical uh, prowess that's sufficient for us. Um, some people love the technical, love the photoshopping, and just continue, continue, continue to learn that. Um, but what I found is most people get to a certain point where they they feel that they've learned kind of enough technically and then they're really their focus shifts into uh, the artistry and, and developing a, a point of view and, and a particular um, way of presenting your work and so that becomes more of a focus so I find when we look at these portfolios of these master photographers and you can really see a, a great breadth of their work uh, across the you know, hundreds of pages of a book you can really appreciate the different ways that they put their kind of their stamp or their style on a lot of different photos. And then for me, studying that, looking at, well, what parts, what photos do I like and what photos do I not like? And the photos I do like, why do I like them? What is impactful to me? What is it the composition? Is it the subject, uh, time and place, all those kinds of things. And so I think that helps develop your artistry a bit more when you're able to study um, a, a wide swath of work like that. Fantastic. Uh, we have here that you prefer creating interesting photos that make you think rather than just pretty pictures. We yeah, we have a, we have a calendar competition at my, um, work every year. People, employees submit photos and they make a, uh, calendar for the employees. And I struggle to find photos because I just don't have pretty landscape photos. Like they like to see all my you know, rusty and crusty stuff or abstracts. Um, those just don't get selected uh, when they when they look for pretty landscapes. So, yeah, I do things a little differently. <laughs> You've been a serious photographer for over 14 years, ever since your wife bought you your first DSLR for Christmas, a Nikon D50. And you said within a year you were already talking about upgrading. <laughs> That's correct. Yes, my, my wife was not happy about that because uh, she got me the camera and two lenses and bag and all the goodies. Um, and so, uh, she actually made me write a theme. We're big fans of uh, the Christmas story. Uh, we're, uh, here, Freddie, um, kid writes the theme about the Red Rider BB gun. So she made me write a theme of why I needed to upgrade my camera. Now, did um, she give you the A plus 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 plus, or did she tell you you're going to shoot your eye out? Uh, I think the latter actually, <laughs> uh, but I still did get the camera and now, uh, I still actually use that D50. I converted it to infrared spectrum. Uh, so I still shoot with it. Um, it's still a great little entry level camera, but yeah, I'm on camera three and lens 11 or some number 11 by now. I think I actually just have one in the mail. So it must be up to 12. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, we have here that you have three tripods, three camera bodies, 11 lenses, five camera bags, and a drawer full of accessories, accessories that you just absolutely had to have at the time. Yeah, those marketing and those magazines can really uh, sell you on something that, I mean, it works for some people, but everyone needs to find their little their little trinkets and doodads that work for them, and what works for one photographer doesn't necessarily apply to another. Right. You have a pile of discarded camera bags and finally decided that the airport commuter by Think Tank was the perfect bag. Why is that? Um, so I, so I now, my um, I have a pro body, so I have a Nikon D4 as my main camera. Uh, being a pro body, it has the, the vertical, integrated vertical grip. So I needed a, a deep camera bag, um, but I didn't want some monstrous thing. Um, so the com commuter was kind of in between um, and has, I like to have one big pouch in the begin in the front of the bag, just so I can stuff whatever random stuff I need, whether it's an extra jacket or an extra flash or something. Um, so it has those, and it's got a couple other things, but yeah, unfortunately, I went through a couple different camera bags until I found that, found the one I that worked best for me. Gotcha. And other than your light painting composites, you don't use Photoshop. What do you use? That's instead? correct. I didn't purchase Photoshop and the whole subscription deal until last 
uh, November when I was uh, doing a light painting workshop and had to stitch photos together. And I still haven't used it um, since that workshop. <laughs> gotcha. Well, thank you, Greg. I'm, we're, we're excited to have you here. Uh, we needed to uh, we needed to bring Greg's presentation over to uh, to our our studio computer, so I'm going to try to move over to that. It may go a little funky for a while. Let's see, see if we can get this over here. Greg, I'm going to bring your presentation up. Okay. Uh, we now have All your right, presentation see. up. Uh, I will ask you that in your Streamyard chat, make sure you have private chat open on the the far right hand side, just in case you need to to give me any information. I need to give you any information about the stream. And then if you okay. can just let me know when you want to move forward and the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you everyone for, for inviting me back. Um, I was looking back through my records and you know, I've presented in, um, at your club in the past and then judged uh, just the other month. So I, I, one advantage of all this online stuff is we can continue to reach out to other photographers not near us. Um, so I'm happy to be invited back. Um, so tonight's topic, leading lines, um, I may cover, I may start off with some kind of familiar, what, what most people would think of when they think of leading lines. Um, and then I try to delve into a little bit of variance uh, of that topic. Um, so try to give you some different ways to approach leading lines. So why don't we go to the next slide? All right, so leading lines, I may talk about uh, three different types. We're gonna talk about uh, straight lines, uh, and then we'll talk about zigzags uh, and curves. And then in the end, I'll wrap it up with some variations. So once you've kind of learned some of these basic techniques, how can you apply it in a, in a slightly different manner? So I have this joke here, objection, your honor, the council's leading the witness. Uh, if you click on the next. So all lead lines is where are they taking me? The, the idea is that the lines are leading you into the image, through the image, or they're leading you to the subject of the image. They can be used in various different ways, but it's all about guiding the viewer. So let's go to the next slide. So we'll start off with the perspective lines. This is what, when people say leading lines is what most people think. Uh, so let's go to the next chart. So this is what a lot of people think of when they think of perspective and leading lines where we have this long, uh, tunnel here at Eastern State, uh, State Penitentiary. Um, and I didn't mention, uh, feel free to stop me at any time. And if you have a question, uh, let me know. I get the metadata for all the photos here. Um, or if you want to know more about a particular photo, um, there's quite a variety of subjects uh, in the presentation. So hopefully there's something in here for everyone. Um, so this is kind of a, a standard uh, interpretation of leading lines where we have a, a tunnel, uh, it's perspective. We have the lines of those pipes and stuff mounted on the walls leading us down. We have the skylights and the, the hanging lights all in line, kind of leading our eye down uh, into the picture. Um, and then even the doors are kind of angled that way from the way the perspective is. So this is a you know, kind of classic, classic case of, of leading lines. So let's move on, next one. So here's another uh, idea. So the other one, the first one was kind of looking low. Uh, this one's shot from an overpass. Um, of some train tracks in Baltimore, actually. Um, and so, again, a kind of classic where we have the lines of the train tracks uh, with my black and white editing, I kind of emphasize the, the glare on the top of the rails there. So it really kind of jumps out at you and leads you down um, into the picture and all the way to the end. And let's go to the next chart. So a lot of times when we get these tunnel type uh, images uh, where we have these kind of lines leading us in. So in this case, we have the path here in the foreground at the bottom uh, leads us in and it's a you know, kind of light sandy path. So our eyes are kind of pulled into that lighter color and leads us into, into the picture um, and into this tunnel. And this is a, a sculpted garden in Vermont at uh, Rudard uh, Kipling's estate. I was doing a photo shoot up there a couple of years ago. So one of the things uh, we encounter with these types of photos, I've heard some judges say it is, I need a payoff. I need, when you're leading me, leading me to something, you need to lead me to a subject. Um, and so in this case, you, you don't have anything at the end of the tunnel. Um, so let's go to the next chart. So we can always add uh, something if we need to, uh, if your favorite uh, unicorn pony uh, in this case, 
But I, I asked the question, do you really need a subject at the end? Can the just the tunnel or whatever perspective lines you have just lead you into the picture and leave it up to the viewer as to what they might imagine to be uh, at the end of that tunnel? Do you actually really need to see something uh, interesting um, there at the end of the tunnel? And so it's really uh, just a personal preference um, but I know some judges like to, like I said, see a payoff at the end, lead me to a subject. Um, but I, I don't necessarily agree with that, but a lot of my photography tends to break standard rules. So um, I'll leave that up to each of you to decide. Let's go to the next chart. So here's another kind of leading line where we have this uh, path. Uh, this is taking the, the Dakotas, I think. And um, so the path with a, a lighter, lighter shade than some of the surrounding vegetation, so it's easy for your eye to kind of follow it um, into the image. And so here, kind of the payoff, as it, as it were, um, would be the mountainscape in the background. The path is leading you uh, up to the mountains and to these hillsides um, at the end of it. Um, and so, so here's a case where, much like the previous photos we saw where uh, we kind of centered the image where the pathway kind of dead center leading in you to center the image. Um, this basically does the same, even though the path isn't a straight line going down through the center of the image like we saw with the train tracks, for example. Uh, with this one, it's a bit of a zigzag um, as it goes into the image. Uh, but we can still see enough of it that we can kind of follow it all the way to that the back, back of the, uh, the grasslands there with the, the sagebrush, I guess it is. Um, leading you right up to the mountains. So there's a, kind of, a couple of different ways to approach this kind of perspective, uh, kind of tunneling effect uh, of leading lines into your image. Again, leading lines, where are they leading me? They're leading me into the image or into or towards a, a subject. So let's go to the next chart. So, so here you can see I, I point out with some arrows. So not only do we have the the pathway, like I said, with having a different tonal value of the lighter the lighter shade, uh, we have the the arrow there pointing where it kind of starts leading us. But then we also have the way the ridge lines of the mountains are, and you know some of this is uh, you know serendipitous. You know I'm not I can't move the mountains um, to to make all the leading lines converge to exactly where I want to, but it can affect with my composition how I angle myself or what how much of the mountains I include or how I dodge and burn during editing to emphasize certain ridge lines and mountains to kind of aid to that fact where we have uh, there on the right green arrow in the back, there's kind of a lighter shade uh, ridge line kind of leading you down right towards the path. And then we have this kind of landslide type effect in the upper left. Um, and so that, that kind of, again, leading you down to the center, which marries up really well with the path we have in the foreground which starts to disappear as it gets towards the back. Uh, we can't see it as clearly and prominently, or at least not the whole thing. So having, looking at the mountains and your subject or whatever you're, you're leading to, um, how you compose that can help aid in just keeping the viewer's focus um, to, to the part of the image that you want them to focus on. Let's go on to the next chart. So here, uh, something a little more subtle with these uh, power lines, um, and this is over in Beltsville, uh, Maryland. Um, and so here, we don't have a pathway, but the lines are coming up over our shoulders and down into the image, and then they allow us to connect with the, path, with the, the telephone poles or power poles, um, whatever you call those structures. Um, and then you see the repetitiveness of those help follow us into the image because the the thin lines of the power lines or telephone lines uh, start to kind of get lost a little bit as we get further away. But then we pick up um, the structure of those power poles um, to help continue us down into the image. And you'll notice, so in this case, the power lines, I have them kind of coming out of the corner a bit, but I kind of made sure they weren't, that I had enough of it, usually from co compositional rule number 52 or something like that says, you know, things shouldn't come out of the corners. Um, so this one with, you know, multiple power lines, I, I felt like it wasn't quite coming out, even it's kind of coming out of the corners. I have enough power lines coming out of the side of the frame, the top of the frame to balance it out. So I'm not breaking that, uh, uh official rule. Uh, so let's go on to the next one. 
so here's a, another take. So, so the, the first one was more obvious where we have kind of that tunneling effect that we saw with some of our first images, uh, the power lines coming right down over our shoulders, leading us in. So here I've kind of broken it a little bit, whereas now we're just coming in from one side. But again, we have so those the, we have the strong lines of those power lines with the backdrop of the soft clouds. Uh, they really stand out, and then allow your eye to kind of catch on those and just ride those right into the image and right into this power line, uh, the the towers. And then again, you can follow the towers down um, into the image. So you, your leading lines don't necessarily have to be a pair, uh, a symmetrical thing like we saw in some of the early photos. Um, you can have it, you know, just coming off of one side or one one part of the image. Again, it's about taking strong elements and leading, allowing, using those to to force the viewer to follow the path that you want them to follow into the image. So, go on, next one. So here, this is in um, Great Smoky Mountains uh, National Park down in Tennessee. Uh, water tr uh, floof, truce, whatever. Um, leading to this old mill. So this one, again, a more obvious uh, where we have this kind of, again, tunneling effect leading us in. But it's not taking up as much as the frame as some of the other image images we've seen so far. We have some other elements in there, but it's just leading me into that point where I have the center of the image with the, with the mill, and then your eye can start to explore you know, adjacent areas and see the water wells and see um, the other things going on over there. So it's not unlike some of the other photos where the leading lines were like the main part of the image. Uh, this one is a little bit more, they're a, a supporting actor, as it were, uh, that help lead us into a different subject for us to explore. Not necessarily a subject that's uh, bigger in the frame or, or more representative in the frame than the leading lines in this case. They're kind of sharing duty, but they're just playing off of each other, that leading line leading you in. Going to the next one, Greg. I have a question here. I'm going to go back. Sure. I'm going to go back to um, to I, I believe uh, this is where Kathy asked a question. We have a little bit of a delay on Facebook. She says, "I okay. thought I thought they should come out of the corners." And I think maybe she's talking about um, your power lines, which look like they're coming out of the corners to me. They they are so, and that's what I mentioned. So I, I have you know a couple, I guess one or two of them, sort of coming out of the corners, but um, by having the additional multiple power lines, so that you know, we have power lines starting kind of at the top of the frame, wrapping around that whole corner. So as a collection, yes, they're coming out of the corner. But I guess the point I was trying to make is if I had a single power line on each and I had it coming directly out of the corners, that's violating, you know, whatever photography rule. Um, so I kind of use that, that rule, but bent it a little bit by saying, well, I got multiple lines and there's they're kind of spread out. So yeah, they're coming out of the corner-ish, uh, but not directly out of the corner, if I'm making sense there. We've had some stickler judges that, that if, if they're, it's kind of like a horizon. If it's not perfectly level, it's completely off. Same thing with corners. We've had some, some judges come in and say, well, it should be perfectly in the corner every time. So I think that's that might be where part of that was coming from. Yeah, and so you know, it's it's uh, you know, depends on your particular composition. If I compose this differently, so all the power lines are coming out of the side of the image, and I'm not quite sure I'd be able to do that. I probably have to get pretty high. I'd end up with too much sky, and it wouldn't um, be blending the image together. Or if I got down really low and had the power lines kind of coming up at the top of the frame, I just I would lose a lot of the ground cover. So I think for the composition I was looking for this is kind of just how it fell out, I guess, as it were. Um, but yeah, some, some judges can get, uh, judges, some judges have their biases and they all have their stickler points. Um, I definitely do like to have straight horizons and I will comment if they're off by, you know, 1.5 degrees is, uh, by my estimate. Um, but that shouldn't necessarily make or break uh, an image. There's a, one of the photographers of the photography books I have is, um, uh, now I've lost his name, Gary uh, Window. Anyway, I forgot his name now. Um, apparently he was notorious for not ha for having crooked uh, horizons. Uh, and he had his work exhibited at some famous gallery and people were complaining about his horizons were all crooked. And so he went up to the gallery wall and took his picture and tilted the whole frame so that the horizon was level and said, see there, are you happy? Um, <laughs> so just, 
don't get so fixated on if one judge is, is stuck on a certain photography rule, um, their guidelines, um, like Pirates of the Caribbean likes to say. Greg, I have, one more, I have one more question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to, your, to where we were. Kathleen okay. says, uh, is there really a numbered list of compositional rules? No, I just like to, I just like to joke on that. Uh, you know, photography rule one, don't put your <laughs> subject in, in the center. Uh, I don't know. I just make them up. I just pick a random number every time I'm giving a presentation. <laughs> I, I'm sure, it, although it would not surprise me that some persons try to monopolize on that and put out a book of you know hundred top photography composition rules. Um, I'm sure Amazon would have something like that, but I am not aware of a specific book. I just make up the numbers. And that could be your style as well. You know, you may like a, a certain compositional rule over over others. Great, yeah. and and it depends. You know, like so they say, don't put your subject in the center of the frame. But if you're into marketing. Um, where you need your sub center of the frame because you have to have the advertisements around the edges or you have to have the, um, the words and text boxes and stuff like that that they need for the magazine covers around the edges. Um, you're constantly breaking that quote unquote rule. So it really depends on your market and, and what you want to do. We have, uh, we have a comment from Scott in, in chat. Gary, uh, Gary Winogrand. Wine, there you go. And he last exhibited at the National uh, Gallery of Art in D.C. And, Greg, you may be on to something because Kathleen says she would totally buy that compositional rules list. Oh, no. Well, I mean, they're definitely great things to think about as you're, you know, it's like the whole rule of thirds and putting stuff on the PowerPoint. Um, they're great when you start out, uh, but you have to, you have to balance what is one, what is your style? And then two, what does the subject demand? Sometimes there's certain photos that just don't work when you follow those certain rules. I know I have some stuff where I've taken a picture and put the, the subject on the PowerPoint on the one third, and I thought that that was the right thing to do. And then when I composed it differently, I realized, no, I was wrong. I should break the rules and, and compose it differently because it's more effective in another another fashion. So. Um, yeah, don't get stuck on rules, I guess is my advice. And we have no more questions at the moment. Would you like to move on? All right. Yeah, let's go on. All right, so in, again, another classic example. Um, so this is a diner in, in Beltsville, I think it is, um, where we have the, the, the stools kind of leading. And if you look really closely with a keen eye on the back, uh, back wall, there's a mirror, and you can actually see me standing. Uh, there I am, yep. You can see me standing there uh, for the long exposure. I think it's about over a minute um, exposure because uh, it's really late at night uh, taking this photo. Um, so there I am kind of blocking wind, I guess, from my tripod as I'm taking this long exposure at nighttime. Let's go on to the next one. Susan in chat says, depending on which Google hit you choose to open, there are seven, nine, 10, 12, or 20 rules of composition. I'm sure, like, oh, like Greg said, there's probably someone who's did who's done a, like a desk calendar of every day That's right. a new rule. Great. Now I'm curious. I have to look this up, see, see yeah. what I think of the, the rules out there. All right. So um, before I go on next section, any other questions popping up? None right now. All right. So let's go. So now we kind of talked about kind of the classic leading lines with these perspectives. So let's talk about how we can use some compositional elements to create lines. Let's go on to the next chart. So here, another scene back uh, back down the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, so this is taken in winter time in February when no one else goes there. And um, so I have a lot of different things going on. And um, if we go to click on the next next slide, there we go, see the arrows. So here we're using lines and in, in not necessarily, a, there's a little bit of a tunneling effect as I'm calling it, where we're kind of perspective pushing us towards the middle of the frame. But you see the way I've composed this, I've used a bunch of different elements to drive the viewer uh, into this image. Obviously, the, the most the obvious one is the, the road there in the center uh, leading us in. But then I have this ridge line on the right, um, kind of forms like a little arrow of sorts, because uh, it's kind of fat there towards the corner and then narrows. Um, and then we have the fence line on the left, uh, leads me down to the tree and then in, in depth into the image. And even some of the branches on the upper left um, we see are kind of all pointing 
uh, towards this uh, tree here in the middle with the hoarfrost on it. And then the, the, the shape of the trees um, just creates a little kind of a curve, kind of creating an artificial tunnel, uh, as it were, just really kind of keep your eye fixated on the center of that frame. And so here's, uh, speaking of photography rules, uh, if you look closely, the true horizon here uh, is there in the background, that separation between the kind of bluish looking trees uh, and the, I guess, grassy field that's back there. Um, so I have put this her true horizon uh, dead center, um, but then I've kind of created this false horizon with the road uh, sits down a little lower. Um, so again, don't get fixated on the rules, you know, work on the composition. In this case, I wanted that tree kind of centered. Um, so yeah, I broke rule number one as well about don't put your uh, subject in the center. So I've broken all kinds of rules, uh, but I can tell you this photo has won numerous awards and been entered in numerous galleries. Um, so clearly they don't care about um, uh, subjects in the center and horizons in the middle. All right, let's move on. All right, so again, another another kind of pathway here. This one's, uh, if, if you're wondering why it looks a little uh, strange, this is actually an infrared photo um, and then converted to black and white. So that's kind of has played with the tones a bit. It's a very flat looking image in, in just standard color or black and white. So that's why I pulled out the infrared camera. So we uh, click one more time. We'll see some of the arrows here. So again, we obviously have the, the pathway leading us in, but then we have that dark line of trees there. And I, I probably um, dodge that a bit in, in post-processing the dark of those, just kind of lead you down into that picture. Um, and then same with the, the cloud line and the top of the trees on the right. And again, I don't have, this is out in nature, so I don't have a lot of control of exactly how these things are shaped uh, and exactly how they point in one direction or another, but I can keep that in mind in my composition and how I position myself and position the camera and then finally in post-processing areas I dodge or burn to emphasize them or to create separation so we get those um, kind of distinctions in, in tonal values that help create those artificial lines. Uh, so that's why this is kind of a compositional line. All right, move on. So here we're back to that same mill we saw a couple pictures ago. Um, so here, again, I've broken photography rule number one, putting the subject kind of in the center, uh, but that's all right. Uh, so if we click one more time, so here we have a, a couple different things. Obviously we have the path there on the right. It's not, uh, it's off to the side, so it's not as uh, kind of direct in your face as, as some of the other paths we've seen on some of the other photos. Uh, but still, it's it's a uh, you know it's covered with a little bit of light morning snow. Like I said, I was there in the February time frame, and um, so that helps it jump out, being a little lighter, uh, lead it, leading you into that doorway. And then on the left there, we have the the trough or the sluice, whatever it's called, um, leading us in right to the the water wheel there. And then and even the fencing that I've included here in the lower left. Uh, almost forms an arrow itself to kind of, again, point you towards that water wheel, point you towards that mill um, in the center. And then even with some dodging and burning down there at the bottom to emphasize um, the different uh, ridge lines and, and kind of valley, I guess it's there. We kind of see that just kind of pointing us, bring us into the image and, and focusing our attention on the main subject. Any other questions as we're going on? Try to catch them as we go. None right now. All right, let's move on. Next one. All right, so uh, you know, compositional lines aren't, aren't just for uh, when you're out uh, doing your your photos that you're aiming to do for your exhibits or your camera club. Uh, even when you're doing your family snapshots. So here I am on a hike with my family. Uh, this is probably in Shenandoah or something. And uh, again, even though I'm capturing uh, a shot of of my wife and son here, I'm still thinking about composition because even though I'm not necessarily going to enter this as award-winning photo, the lighting is pretty harsh, um, but I can still use my tools and my expertise to create a, a more appealing, interesting photo um, to even for my Facebook followers. Um, so here we click one more time. Again, we see the pathway. Uh, it's got some bright light on it, but we have the, the one in the bottom there leading right up to the couple. 
and then as well as the the light on the back one. So you know, I could have in post processing done done some um, you know dodging and try to get some of the brightness off that path in the background. But I think for me, it, it helps add a little bit to the image to uh, brighten the kind of lead 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 to my wife and son there um, that are in in the shade and kind of emphasize them by drawing your eyes to that bright spot and then the way it's shaped kind of leading you down to the couple. And then I, of course, I broke photography rule number 772, where I have the tree growing out of my wife's head. So that was a kind of a faux pas on me. Uh, but if you ever, ever uh, been out uh, hiking with your family and, and trying to take uh, some quality pictures, uh, if your family is like mine, they get pretty antsy uh, when you start uh, whipping out tripods and light meters and, and stuff like that. So sometimes you have to work quickly. Uh, and when you work quickly, sometimes uh, little escapes get by you. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, so here's a, a kind of a difference. So we, we've shown a lot of examples of paths uh, and, and, and lead, really strong leading lines. So here's another way of a, a strong leading line for you birders out there um, when you find a, a bird on a perch. Um, so this one's up at the Getty Museum in um, California. And so there's these little tiny hummingbirds and they were just perching on these um, uh, birds of paradise uh, flowers. And so here we have this, I mean, you, you can't get more serendipitous than this, where we have a pointed uh, flower there uh, leading you right to my subject of the hummingbird uh, perched on the end. Go on to next. Greg, we have a question. Sure. Do you, do you identify all the leading lines prior to taking the photo or after? Can you talk a little bit about your process of, of seeing a scene? trying to find out what compositional elements you may have and, and how you kind of test them out and pick which one to go with? Um, there, there definitely is some of that. I think when I evaluate uh, a scene, one of my kind of pro tips, as it were, um, as people like to say these days, pro tip or life hack, um, I like to whip out uh, my iPhone. I always have my, my phone with me. And if you're an Android, fine. I, I whip out my smartphone. And I'll actually do some composition just with the phone because I it's very small and portable. Um, I have this you know nice size screen I can see, and I can move myself around easily and kind of see uh, what works and what what doesn't work. And yeah, definitely take that into consideration of where are some of the strong elements, where are some of the strong lines, um, and how are they pointing or leading to my subject. Um, you know, make sure they're not leading my subject out of, or my viewer out of the frame uh, if I have a strong line somewhere. Um, but there is, there is, you know, I think the more you do it, the more you concentrate for looking uh, for those kinds of things, uh, it starts to become a little second nature and that you kind of start moving yourself around and then all of a sudden like, ah, that's, that's the, that's the perspective. That's, that's the point I want. Um, and then you'll set up your camera and tripod. Um, but don't uh, don't get uh, complacent though. Um, you always want to take different compositions and different angles. Um, I know it happens to me all the time where I've spent some time with my phone. I've kind of thought what I what I thought was the right composition. I got the lines exactly where I want. Um, I take a photo and or a photo two, and then I say, well, let me try a couple different compositions, uh, different angles or whatnot. And then when I get back on my computer and have some more time to study it, I realize I missed some. There was some leading line that's leading my viewer out of the picture in the, in the original um, view that I picked, um, and that a different view is better. So sometimes it, it definitely takes a little bit of staring at the photo uh, back, on, back on your computer um, to kind of figure out what's best, and maybe you're doing some different cropping on your computer even uh, to bring out the image. So it's kind of a long answer there, but basically it's a little bit of both, I guess. I, I do think about it when I'm in camera and compos composing. Um, but I definitely take different vantage points and different compositions so I can think about it more back on my computer. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, so again, here's another bird first. So uh, unlike the other one where it's you know, kind of directly leading to it, here we just have the very strong lines of the perch uh, there, this dead tree uh, leading us to this um, egret in Shinkatink. So not directly leading us um, to the subject per se, because we kind of have two of them, but they, they're, again, they're strong elements kind of leading us from the bottom of the image um, right up into the image uh, where we have the bird perched. So there's, I guess, by showing me this compared to the, the hummingbird, 
you don't want you to get fixated on you. You have to have exactly one one leading line that's a, one super strong line that leads you in. You can have a couple different lines that leading you in and kind of framing the image. Let's go on to the next one. All right, so here, here this the leading lines on this one may be a little less obvious. And and again, this you're out in nature, you, you can't you can't control the clouds. Uh, you can stand there for a long time and, and wait for them to move uh, a little bit. Uh, but this, you know, definitely with some dodging and burning in post-processing to bring out the different uh, clouds here. If you click one more time, so we kind of have a perspe the perspective with the um, with the the sun shades on the on the picnic benches. We go from the small one on the far right, lead, gradually getting bigger to the to the biggest one, and that's just a perspective uh, shift. Um, so we have that is kind of leading us, kind of like they're on a um, I like to think this as uh, planes on an aircraft carrier or something like that, ready to take off. But if you look at the clouds and where the positions of the bright spots and the dark spots, we have kind of, uh, like I've talked to some of the other photos about ridge lines of mountains. Um, you kind of think of the clouds that way where we have a bright bank of them uh, right behind the, the three picnic, picnic tables. But then we also have kind of a dark line where we have a separation between the sky and the mountains there on the right. Uh, kind of forming a natural break that again is kind of leading you down into the image. So these things are a little more subtle uh, leading lines and I guess I caution you, I don't know who your judge is for your leading lines presentation. They might not uh, take this as a, a true example of leading lines. Um, but one of the things I want you to get out of this presentation, uh, much like our discussion about photography rule list, um, is that there's these these great things that you learn in the beginning and it's great for certain compositions, but a lot of compositions don't fall into the rules. They don't fall into these, these standards that we can apply. And so it's about taking some of those, those tips and those ideas and those concepts and then extrapolating them uh, into your own vision and your own kind of framing of your image, if that makes sense. Let's move on to the next one. Is there a question? I'm just double checking here. Um, <laughs> just just comments in the chat. No questions yet. Okay. Okay. Um, so so here again, we're, man, I, I must have really loved Shinkatik when I was going through my uh, images. Um, so this is also uh, from Shinkatik at the Bay side uh, of Sunset. And so here, much like the clouds on our previous image, we don't have necessarily we have some leading lines. If you click one more time, let's see kind of with this dark bank of, um, of the boats and, and, the, and the dock area there in the bottom left, um, that kind of forms a little wedge or a little triangle. So we kind of have a, a line created there from the separation between the bright water and the darkness there kind of leading you along that bottom edge or that bottom corner. And then the lines in the, the middle clouds are kind of going side to side. Um, so it's kind of leading the viewer's eyes kind of side to side in that image. And then we have some kind of angled clouds in the top part of the image kind of leading on diagonal. So, so here, this leading lines is maybe a little bit misleading, maybe you might call it, uh, because the lines aren't necessarily leading you in one particular direction. Uh, they're just kind of leading you about the image. And so this will kind of play into the zigzags that we'll talk about um, coming up, where the lines don't always have to lead you to one specific place. One person says this view is fuzzy. Yeah, one uh, one of our one of our chat people said uh, it looked a little fuzzy on their screen, and uh, and another another of our uh, of our members said that uh, if he's watching it on his flat screen like he usually does, go get a beer; it'll make it better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does look a, a tad bit soft to me, um, but uh, you're not doing. We're not doing judging, um, so wouldn't worry about it for now. All right, let's move on. So I think I have just a couple more examples of uh, these kind of lean lines, and we're getting some zigzags. Uh, so again, here we have a very strong element in the middle, um, but if we look around it. Uh, we got some other instances where there's some separation between bright water and dark water or different edges and lines. And if we click one more time, we kind of see that. So we obviously have the rock formation in the middle, but 
But then we have uh, where the waterfall on the left uh, is breaking onto the flat. So we're seeing kind of a, a line created there as well as some swirl there where kind of the pool of water turns a little bit more turbulent, creating a line there. And then on the far right, uh, the various little mini waterfalls as the water's flowing down um, over the different ledges there. And this is Great Falls. This is shot from the Virginia uh, observation side. So again, again, we're looking for ways that we're kind of creating some artificial lines and just the way we compose them uh, helps us just lead the viewer in. Uh, although in this image that the rock formation uh, in the center is so big and bold uh, and I really darkened it compared to the rest of the image, um, that alone is enough to really draw your eyes in. But still, you know, taking into account some of these other elements, uh, we can just continue to focus our viewer's attention and keep the viewer's attention focused in towards the middle of the frame. Let's go on to the next. And one last one, so this is a pan art. I tried to put a variety of different uh, photos in there, different subjects. Um, so this is a three three horizontal um, pano. This is uh, here in Colorado from just a few weeks, uh, about a month ago. And so so here we don't have, we have the path there, it's a road in the, in the lower left. Uh, it's not as prominent, so it's not quite the leading line, but the, uh, the ridge line, the, the tree lines on the, the far right and the far left, those are kind of leading us down right into that valley. We have that dark, dark tree line on the right, separated by the, by the bright sky. So it forms a nice line, leading you down towards the center of the image. Uh, and then similarly on the left, we have the, the green trees and the green hillside, contrasting to the, the mountains that are further in the background, creating a line, just leading us right into that valley. And then the the mountain range in the back with all the red, uh, the red clay, a lot of iron in the soil. This is the mining district of Colorado. So a lot of iron and stuff in the soil. Um, that itself is kind of forming a diagonal line down towards the right. So we have these, these strong lines up front leading us down into the valley. And then this other line kind of leads us kind of around the corner, kind of a, uh, you can kind of feel yourself saying, oh, I wonder what's around the corner. What's, what's, what's further down in the valley. And so that's the, the whole intent of these lines is just focus our attention, lead us into and through the picture. All right, next. All right, so let's talk about zigzags. So we, we talked a little bit about them in some of these uh, other images uh, with the straight lines. Let's go to the next, uh, next frame. So here again, um, so unlike the other one where we had all the, the ridge lines, uh, the, the mountain lines leading us into a valley, uh, here we have just kind of a layering effect. And so if we click one more time, here we see kind of a zigzag effect, right? We have a one line going one way, another line takes us another way. And again, it kind of just has this wave through the image um, as we zigzag across these, the, at the tops of these treetops uh, on these different mountain, mountain sides. And go on to the next. So this is a super obvious uh, zigzag. This is a parking lot. Um, I just thought this was an interesting graphic. Um, so as a little aside on, on this photo, and one of the reasons I included this one, and I think and this one was probably taking my camera. Sometimes I put stuff in here from my iPhone. Um, I, I put this in here, not that this is a award-winning image or, or I'd want this to be a first place in the leading lines competition. Uh, but I put this in here to, to showcase that as you start to learn these kinds of skills and these compositional techniques and, and these um, different effects, you always want to be looking for them, always studying uh, your surroundings, always on the lookout. So here I am at this, this parking lot. I think this is a way station in, in Shenandoah. And I just saw these empty parking spaces. I think we were there in the fall, so it wasn't a very busy time. And it was forming this zigzag. And so I could have just said, oh, that's interesting and, and walked on. But I, I took the moment to say, hey, let me, let me take a picture of that. Let me, let me compose something, you know, a decent composure and, and capture this. And the reason I do that is one, it's that um, stopping and focusing and, and with, you know, taking your picture with intent um, really causes you to kind of focus on, well, what is my composition here? How, how are these lines working towards my image? And even though I knew when I took this image, well, this is not going to be an award-winning image by any means, 
I'm practicing my craft. And so you always want to, as you learn these things, keep practicing, practicing. Um, and then of course, when I am reviewing my images in Lightroom and going through uh, your different things, like keyword search everything, so everything gets grouped together. Um, you know, I can come across this image and I go, oh yeah, remember that day with the zigzag lines? Um, and then that, that thought, that concept kind of nests in the back of my mind. So then when I'm out in nature, looking at other things, I can say, okay, now how do I apply that man-made zigzag that I saw into uh, uh, something I see in nature? How can I kind of marry the two between this and something else I see? So let's go on to the next one. So here, um, it's a house we rented, had a lot of doors. And so this one, it's leading lines or maybe it's another case where they're not as obvious. Um, if we click one more time, some of the arrows. So we have the kind of angle of that forward door kind of leading you into the bright spot on the wall there, kind of pointing the way. Um, and then the way the, the door on the right's angle that kind of leads you into that bright room uh, on the right. But then we see some other bright parts in the back of the, the, back of the frame uh, with the different doors and with the perspective, I get those angles. So they kind of lead me back there. So here's a case where leading lines, much like the um, sunset in Chincoteague uh, with the, the boat and the water and, and the clouds, our lines don't necessarily have to lead us in one particular place. They can lead us in a couple of different locations. Um, again, some judges may, may say poor form and that that's not true leading lines. I need my, my unicorn, my little pony there at the end. Um, and, and that's fine for those judges. Um, if you, I guess I judge for you guys recently. Uh, if you see my judging, I, I definitely don't always follow all the judging rules that other judges may follow. So um, I like to think a little bit wider um, than some judges' narrow, narrow opinions. So here's just, a, again, we're exploring how leading lines, we have some traditional usages of them, and then how we can incorporate some of those concepts into our image and extrapolate and take them a little bit further kind of to the next level. Let's go on to the next one. So abstracts, uh, something I like, I like doing these kind of, I call them abstracts, uh, but most people might call them close-ups, but I like to do these uh, close-ups of textures and things I find in nature, but it's not just about capturing this, you know, interesting kind of blue colored rock. Um, I, I am, back to the earlier question that someone asked, I am thinking about, you know, lines and, and how, how the viewer is going to weave through this image. And so looking at this image, you might not immediately, might not immediately jump out at you uh, the leading lines in this image, but there actually are some. If we click the next button, you kind of see we have this uh, the little shadow there from the lower left that forms a little separation. And then we have some jagged, uh, jagged bits there um, that form a separation from the, the soft uh, flat pieces. So I am kind of thinking about that in my composition with these uh, close-up abstracts of how the eye can kind of bounce through the image and follow this. Uh, again, this is, it's a bit more subtle. I, I wouldn't necessarily give this first place in the leading lines competition. But again, it's not just about, I need the perfect calendar photo to win the competition. Uh, it's about, you know, taking these concepts and creating your own variants of them to create your own artistic stamp on the photos that you take i was going to wait a little bit to to uh to for this comment greg but i think this photo is is perfect for this elaine says in chat that it is fascinating to discover that leading lines are not always obvious yes yes yeah so so i'd be curious to, to hear um or maybe i'll have to look on your, your facebook page after you record it um what pet types of entries that people have for the leading lines is everyone just uh, you know, streets of New York and, and tunnels and gardens, uh, or people trying to take a, a different interpretation, more expanded interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. Again, it's it's leading lines are leading you. They're leading you through the image, leading you to something, leading you around the image. Um, they're guiding the viewer, and there's different ways and different outcomes that that can play out. All right, let's go on to the next one. All right, caution curves ahead. Um, so this kind of plays right on the zigzags. Um, sometimes curves are a little bit more graceful 
um, and we uh, tend to gravitate towards those a bit more. So let's go on the next one. So I uh, start off with kind of a classic uh, case of, of perspective where we have the, the curves of this track. And this one's, um, this is also in Maryland. This is in uh, Relay, just outside BWI Airport. Uh, yet, if none of you have ever been to Relay. It's a very small town. Just um, I used to work in Northrop Grumman there, right in Linthicum. Um, and it's, so it's right nearby there. Um, it's a really a, got some really nice uh, architecture, some really old ho homes there. It's an old railroad stop. Um, and the Mark train now goes through there. Um, but there's uh, this one, I'm, just as a disclaimer, I'm not standing on the tracks. Uh, that is dangerous all the time. And it's especially dangerous on an active train track such as this, where the Mark train goes through here, here a couple times a day. Um, but it actually, I positioned myself um, on the side of the track, I actually stood on top of my SUV. And with the way the tracks were curving, I was able to position myself and zoom in so that it looks like I'm standing on top of the tracks when, when really I'm safely about 20 feet off to the, to the side of the tracks. So just a disclaimer there, don't stand on tracks for a photo. I don't care how great the photo is. Um, this again is another infrared shot if you're wondering why the trees are all white. So again, this is a classic case where we have uh, these curving lines leading us into the image and back towards the back of the image. I, I didn't put up My Little Pony at the end there for you, so I apologize if you need a subject um, payoff point. Uh, you're not gonna get it with this photo, um, but I don't think it necessarily needs it. This one is just about, it's a graphic uh, of these lines. And then I chose to shoot this in infrared because the trees were very uh, dark. They're you know, some sort of pine tree or, or dark green tree, I was probably there in summertime. And it was just gonna be too dark uh, and I wouldn't be able to get the train tracks and the gravel to jump out as much as I liked. I think I probably actually shot this in color first and, and realized that. And so then I said, well, how can I get some different tonal variations to help um, you know, really emphasize my leading line? And so that's when I thought, ah, well, if I use my infrared camera, uh, all those trees uh, will turn white because uh, that's what the infrared spectrum, at least the 720 nanometers true infrared uh, that's what it does. They actually look like pinkish orange or something like that, my, my true thing, and then I convert that to black and white. And if you ever, if people are interested in infrared, I can always come back another time and do a presentation on infrared photography. Um, so let's move on. I love taking my, my camera to the beach, uh, take walks with my family. Uh, they hate it when um, they see me grab my camera as we go for our lovely walk with my wife because um, she knows I'm be stopping and taking pictures along the way. Uh, but the nice thing about taking pictures at the beach is you usually have plenty of light and so you don't need to worry about a tripod and you can handhold all your shots. So here there's just an interesting kind of uh, pattern formed in the between the, I guess, whatever waves were on the beach the night before and then the way the wind was in the morning. I uh, created this interesting pattern uh, on the right uh, compared to the kind of less disturbed sand on the left and then this ribbon in the middle. So much like the paths and stuff that we saw, the pathways in the earlier photos, we have kind of a strong uh, element that's just leading us through the image. Um, and I, I also did sort of follow the photography rules with the rule of thirds and kind of one third of the image is the, the flat sand and two thirds of it is the textured. Uh, it's probably not exactly one third, two third, um, but definitely did take that compositional rule into consideration. But for me, it was really about this ribbon uh, separating these two sand structures, uh, leading me all the way through the image. Let's go to the next one. All right, so uh, waves. So this is in Glacier National Park. So I, I'm, I'm highlighting some of these uh, places, uh, one for people that like to know where stuff is, but also show that a lot of the photos in this presentation are from Maryland and Virginia area. So real close to you guys. Uh, so field trips, where you can socially distance um, uh, or physically distance as a new phrase people try to use, um, where are places you can go. So, but this one's in Glacier in Montana. So right off the bat, um, people say, well, there's no leading lines in this. What? There's no lines. It's just a jumble of a jumble of water. So I'll give you a second to think about it before I show you the lines. Think about where where I have lines. Again, thinking lines not necessarily leading us from a, a point, but leading us into and around the image. So we'll go ahead and click one more time. See here with the waves kind of crashing, 
kind of forms these kind of little sloping lines that kind of create a, a kind of sideways funneling, tunneling effect. Um, and again, this one's uh, not as obvious as much like my blue rock that we showed earlier, that yes, it's not maybe a true leading line, um, but it's that extrapolation again. It's the, the taking the concept and how do I use that in other photos that maybe aren't a true uh, kind of perspective or pathway leading line? How can I take those ideas, but uh, consider them? And so obviously again, I'm not, I can't control the waves and the motion. So this is a case where I'm just taking dozens and dozens of photos from, from a single vantage point. Uh, and then later back on my computer where I can see them big screen looking and figuring out which is the best one with the best wave wave pattern that works for um, the image I'm trying to achieve. So let's go on. We have a, we have two comments. We have a comment from sure. Ron, Ron in chat. And he says, some of our recent judges would have demanded that the lens would, uh, excuse me, that the lines would run from lower right to upper left and perfectly in the corners. Like we kind of talked about a little bit before. Yeah, they're and, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> personal, personal preference, right? Yes, yes. And then Elaine says, and they would have wanted them to lead directly to or from the subject. Correct. So yeah. there, there's the people that like the My Little Pony um, <laughs> in the middle. And, and I, I was at uh, one of my clubs. I think it was, I, I'm not going to say, I'll, I'll keep the eight names of the innocent. Um, I was at a club meeting. We had some presentation, and I don't know what the subject was, but clearly someone had some type of strong leading lines, but it didn't lead to any subject, quote unquote. And the judge threw it out, and that was her specific comment. Like, I need the payoff. You can't lead me to, to nothing. You can't lead me to this open space in your image. I, I need the payoff. And so that's where I got that phrase from, the payoff. Um, so I, I just don't think it's true. I mean, when I look through the many photography books I have where these you know famous pho photographers, and, and famous not by my standards, I mean, but these are photographers who are exhibited you know, at, at MoMA and, you know, famous art galleries across the world and their pictures sell for a gazillion dollars. Um, and I look through some of these books and I go, man, man, a photography judge, they throw these things out. Like, these are horrible. There's, there's blown highlights and lost shadow detail. And we got clipping of, of fingers and toes and, oh, guys, they're horrible. Um, but clearly the, the art market sees something a little bit different. Um, so again, don't get hung up on your judges, including me. I, I mean, I'm sure I have my own biases and people have probably snarled at some of my comments or some of my selections and my judging. Um, so, but we're all human. We all have our biases. One of my but favorite, he, he, go ahead. Go ahead. One of my uh, favorite so things I, is I try to, I try to keep finding, I, I saw it about 15 years ago. Somebody made a video with all those, those artworks that you talk about that are actually hanging in the National Gallery that sold for gazillions of photos, and they put current photo judge terminology on it, and all of them were just garbage. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, like one of my favorite photographers is Vivian Meyer, a uh, street photographer, and you know, she didn't do any editing really on her photos. It's just whatever whatever she captured with the camera because uh, she didn't do, um, you know, didn't develop, didn't develop a lot of her film. Uh, but they're, you know, they're publishing these works and they may be doing some manipulation before they publish the books or make the prints. But um, still, you see these technical errors in her photos. But I, yes, I noticed them from a because I'm a judge and I, I look for those kinds of things. Um, but it still doesn't take away from the overall impact of the photo. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, like this photo here not award-winning photo i probably wouldn't compete this for any reason but for instructional purposes about taking these concepts and taking them a little bit further i think it works in that concept um so you, you do have to take that into play too that some of your photos can be interesting photos and good uh, that you enjoy but not necessarily competition worthy or your know, magazine worthy um just because you're playing to a different audience rich says sometimes the lines are the subject it can be, it can be. I mean, definitely like with the, the train tracks we saw earlier on, you know, that was a very strong, you know, compositional element. Um, and that, that was the focus of that image was those train tracks, those, those, those rails, uh, you know, lit by the sunlight. So that is definitely can be true. And well, let's move on to the next one. I'm tired of looking at this uh, <laughs> mediocre picture. I'll move to the next one, but then I have a couple more comments. Jackie says, some people don't understand that it is the journey, not the destination that is the point of the image which goes back perfectly to your 
uh, to your bio, which is you prefer interesting photos that make you think rather than just pretty pictures. Correct. And I, and I often say that at the beginning of my judging that, uh, you know, a interesting photo that allows me to, you know, continue to look at it and really study and really dive into the photo, that photo is going to, even though that photo may have uh, technical issues, that is going to win out every single time over a photo that's technically perfect, but boring, like something I wouldn't want to see. Um, we had a, a competition, one of my uh, clubs and this guy taking a picture of a, a wrench or something like that in his workshop. And he, he didn't win because it was a, to me, it was just, it was a, it was a nice picture of a wrench, but it was just against a plain background. It wasn't particularly nothing artistic about it. And he was telling us later that, oh, this is a hundred picture photo stack. I got maximum sharpness from the from the beginning of the, the top of the wrench all the way to the back of the wrench and it's technically perfect. I just wanted to tell him like, yeah, it's technically perfect, but it's boring. And and he didn't see that. He was just so focused on the technical aspect. I gotta follow the rules. I have to have maximum sharpness for this macro shot. Um, and so let's, uh, so this is a kind of leads good into this. So I like to show this to show um, someone, you know, had the question earlier about, am I looking at these kind of leading lines when I'm taking these photos? So here I'm at uh, Rawlings Conservatory um, up in uh, Druid Park, up in Baltimore. And I saw this interesting little, it's called white paintbrush, um, interesting little plant on the ground. So it's not very big. Um, I just thought it was interesting with these petals kind of overlapping. So I set my camera up uh, with my macro lens. So if we go to the next image, we'll see the result. There we go. There we go. Um, so this is the final composition I came up with um, where you know, I'm taking all that kind of disorder that there was with just all these petals everywhere and trying to find a way to create a compelling image. Um, in this case, it was really about the lines, the, really the edges of these petals uh, lit by a little uh, side light. And I probably emphasize that a little bit in post as well, but a um, little bit of side light there making the kind of really pop that kind of white line forms this nice little S curve right through the middle of the image. Um, yeah, it's kind of centered, I guess, uh, with the S, but eh, that's a fine break that roll all the time apparently. Um, but if we click one more time, so this is something where I am kind of considering, well, how are all the, if, so my subject is that S curve of those, the side lit, the little hairs on those those two main petals. But how are all the other elements supporting that? And I had different compositions of this bush. There was a couple of different um, ways I, I composed it, but I ended up liking this one the best. And because you see these petals, they're all pointing me towards uh, that kind of S curve in the middle. Um, even though they're all overlapping and kind of going different ways, it's those curves. Those curves are all pointing, leading me towards the center of the frame. And, that, and then my eye obviously drawn to the brightest part of the frame with that, that white, uh, those little white hairs. Greg, so real let's quick. go back. So, sorry, go back one real quick. Okay. Back to, uh, sorry, back to, back to the, yeah. So here again, so there, there it is. And you can see that that S curve and stuff is not necessarily obvious upon initial inspection. Uh, you know, it definitely took some time of, thinking about it and looking closely at it and then trying to get my tripod to be able to line up uh, to that composition. And, and I'm sorry, you had a question? I'm, I'm glad you came back to this slide because Mary Lou is asking, do you have a, a favorite tripod that you like using? Yes. So I'm on tripod number two. I actually, well, I have a third one, but that, that's just to hold a light. Um, this is a really right stuff. TL 37 or something like that. It's their uh, mid-weight uh, carbon fiber tripod, um, and it's the, the long version. So without a center column, it goes up to uh, about 60 inches or so. So pretty much up to, you know, at, well, actually above eye level. It goes, so it must be, must be over six, just over six feet with the camera and stuff on it. Um, that is my favorite. Um, a lot of people love Gitso. Um, I will we'll save my Gitso stories for another day. Uh, but I gravitate towards, towards the really right stuff early on. It's just as expensive as the Gitso, unfortunately. Um, it is all made in the USA, which I thought was uh, one little interesting sales point that they have down to every nut and bolt is what they say. Um, 
And I like it because it's pretty compact. It's well, compact-ish. Um, if I take the feet off and take the head off, um, it collapses down to about 22, 21, 22 inches, just enough to fit in my carry-on bag diagonally. Uh, so when I travel, uh, if I'm planning to do any photos, uh, a lot of times like if I'm on a business trip and I think I might have an extra afternoon or extra morning uh, before my flight, um, I travel to California a lot and sometimes the flight times are kind of wonky there. You have the morning or afternoon and those are your only options. So a lot of times I'll take my camera gear and do some photos while, um, before I head, head back home. So taking the feet off and taking the head off, it fits diagonally in that carry-on bag, so that was important to me. Um, but the nice thing about this without center columns, it goes down totally flat. Um, so I'm only sitting off the ground just a couple of inches and that's really made up by uh, the, the ball head I have on there. Um, so again, T, it's a TL 37, 27, something like that. It's the, their mid-weight uh, mid one. And for the camera I use and the smaller lenses I use, uh, it's plenty. I think it holds 60 pounds of weight. So it's plenty uh, for me. Um, and then it goes up really high, uh, which is nice. So it can go to eye level. I'm, I'm about six feet tall, uh, but it's also great when I'm out in nature and I'm standing on a hill or a railing or something's in my way and I have to stretch my legs over it and the, and the front legs end up being further down the hillside or something like that, having an extra reach of those legs uh, works. And then I, not having the center column creates maximum stability. Nice. So that was a really long description, but um, I, I love it. It was expensive, um, but I, I can't say enough good things about it. I've been really happy with it. All right, any other questions about this? These couple photos. None right now. All right, let's move on. So we'll go a couple more slides, one more. All right, so kind of another way of curves. So um, this was just kind of a fun project I did one winter. We had collected a bunch of seashells when probably we were at Chicotique. Uh, so we used to go there all the time, a couple times a year. Um, and so I just kind of created some kind of, eh, these kind of standard photos, you know, just with some black cloth or whatever. Um, but here we have the, the curves kind of taken to the max where we have a spiral um, and the leading line of the curve kind of leading you into the, the eye, the, the point of the seashell there. So again, not a, not a necessarily award-winning photo. Um, I tried to do some interesting things with lighting on it. Um, but again, just demonstrating that how am I seeing things? How am I seeing lines and form and structure in my photos? And don't be afraid to just try different experiments and try different things. Just be, don't, some people get hung up that, well, if the photo is not going to turn out to be a award winning photo, then why am I wasting my time? And I don't think it's a waste of time to constantly be practicing your craft and constantly evaluating subjects and lines and form. Um, I think that's one of the best ways to grow as a photographer. And this is a great, you know, indoor project for winter time. You find, Find those seashells that your kids or your wife or yourself have collected um, and try to find, you know, interesting compositions or try interesting lighting like I tried with this one. Semi-successful, I'd say. All right, let's move on. Uh, again, back to Maryland. I told you, a chock full of uh, local local places. Um, this is Patapsco State Park right outside of Baltimore, um, this aqueduct. So here we're kind of com uh, combining a couple of things that we've already been talking about. We have some curves, obviously the, the curved archway of the bridge, uh, as well as a kind of a curved slash straight line of the top of the, uh, it's a railroad bridge. Um, it was also aqueduct at one point. Um, railroad bridge kind of leading you down. So again, this one maybe doesn't necessarily lead me to a particular subject. Um, and so whether it's leading lines, I don't know, but I put it in there just to show, a, a, again, another variation of this concept of strong lines and kind of leading us. So I think those, even though the diagonal line of the bridge kind of does start sort of in a corner and kind of goes into a tree line and doesn't have a, a cool train there um, to lead you to, I think the arches, though, help kind of curve and kind of keep you into the image and so kind of exploring different parts of the image. Let's move on. And then again, a pretty obvious curve with this uh, flowing water. Um, this is in Great Falls, I think, um, just kind of leading us down through the image. So this one's a little more standard. We have a, a kind of like the pathways we saw in the beginning images, 
kind of dead center, yes, dead center subject, whatever. Um, but we have this nice kind of curve just kind of flowing us down nicely through the image and I've darkened all the surrounding areas so it really kind of pops out and forms that really strong, strong element uh, of a line. All right, moving on. All right, so I've already kind of uh, definitely taken some liberties already uh, on leaning lines in some of the photos, uh, but let's take it even one step further. Um, I like to call this variations on a theme. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. I saw uh, Paul Dermy was a um, he was a writer uh, in the early 1900s, and I, but I love this. I thought it applied really well to photography to make continuous discoveries in the visual world. One need only to look with eyes whose retina with each blink become virgin again. So you're always seeing things differently. All right, so a couple, let's go on the next one, guys. Just a couple more, hang with me. I know we're at the, over the hour mark here. Um, so here's a, I love finding these uh, straggler vine type things uh, surrounding these trees. So uh, again, we're not gonna say having strong leading lines like some of the other photos, but if we click one more time, I'm definitely taking that concept of, I have that one strong line of the main kind of branch there, uh, starting at the bottom and kind of leading me up. But then I have these other branches um, and just the way I've composed it to have them kind of coming in from the top to really focus your attention uh, down there towards the middle of the image. All right, next. Um, love taking pictures of old broken trees. So again, we have uh, sort of like that last picture, but uh, kind of a wave uh, of the of the of the tree there, uh, kind of starting at the right, and we have some strong lines, and so that but we have that one kind of curved line that's really prominent there, starts in the lower right and leads you up towards um, the kind of ragged part of the the tree there, really kind of leading you through that image, much like the waterfall we saw just a, a few slides ago. All right, next. All right, so this one's a little bit more complex, but. Uh, sort of like the mill shot we saw where we're looking at, uh, we have the kind of strong line of the, the water flowing through, but then we have these, these ridge lines created by these rocks, um, kind of creating um, some arrows. So if we click one more time, I think I show some arrows on there. Where we see kind of the lines kind of pointing us through and pointing us down. Again, this is not as obvious an example maybe as some of the others, but definitely something I'm keeping in mind as I'm composing the image to make sure everything's supporting everything else. All right, next one. So here's another one, much like the blue rock we saw a while back, maybe not as obvious uh, when you're composing this kind of abstract image. Um, but if you look closely, much like that blue rock we saw a while back, um, where the transitions are between the cracked mud and uh, the non-cracked mud, um, there is some kind of dark lines. And we click one more time, This is something I'm seeing. So this is not very obvious. This is almost like the water, the, the rushing water we saw. It's maybe not as obvious an idea of, of leading lines, but I am kind of thinking of those lines and leading through and composing my, my abstract to, to take account for where I'm seeing these breaks between darks and lights and kind of creating some, some lines as, as it were. All right, next. Uh, so again, our abstract. So here I've done a little bit of dodging and burning, trying to bring out some of those uh, forward ferns. But this is, you know, this is very busy. Um, there's a lot going on here. Um, but I, as I composed this, I was kind of thinking about we have the kind of strong fern on the left and some of the other ones, and then how I did some brightening and darkening in post processing to bring that out. If we click one more time, see, I kind of have these kind of lines formed. So again, not not as strongly line lead me to one point, but this is kind of like a zigzag example where I have various lines leading me around the image and kind of allowing me to focus on different aspects of the image. We got just a few more, one more, click it, go ahead. So here are the kind of obvious where the lines are lines. We have these, uh, these pipes uh, leading you down to these junction boxes. Um, so this is a very graphic image. Um, you know, there's not a lot of big subject there other than those two junction boxes in the middle. But again, your lines sometimes can be very obvious. Like someone was saying earlier, the lines can be the, the subject themselves. And I think in this case, those conduit uh, pipes are just as much a part of the image as the, as the two junction boxes. All right, one more. So um, 
again, this one maybe not as obvious example lean lines, but if we look at the the chairs on the upper left, uh, we have some kind of side lighting on those armrests. And so they're all kind of pointing towards that piano. Um, and then the piano itself is forming various wedges and kind of arrow shapes that kind of point you back towards the chairs. And then the chairs are pointing back towards the piano. So it's kind of forming a dance uh, to, to ping pong you back and forth and kind of keep you centered in that image. All right, and I think one last photo. So this is uh, one we had a, um, my camera club, we had a, comp comp uh, a comp competition topic, sorry. Uh, it was uh, called illusion. So I, I, I didn't make a mistake. I said earlier, the only time I've used Photoshop is for this light painting photos. I did use it for this assignment as well, where I took some pictures of prairie dogs um, and composited them on this picture of the moon uh, surface I found on the internet. But I did kind of think about leading lines uh, as I'm composing this image. And we click one more time. So again, a bit of a zigzag, uh, but we have the strong element of the prairie dog there on the, on the left side. He's the biggest, most prominent. Um, but then we kind of have you, your, lot, your eyes kind of bounce between the different prairie dogs, right? They're, they're different textures, a bit of different lighting to them. So they stand out a little bit different than the moon. So your eye kind of ping pongs around them and feeds your way back into the image. And then of course we have the one there in the, in the lower right uh, looking right at you. So that kind of grabs your attention. So there's kind of two strong elements, but then I have two really bright uh, prairie dogs in the back. Um, so it's leading line kind of perspective back there. So maybe not as obvious an example, but again, I'm, I'm thinking about these things as I'm making these compositions and how your eye is going to weave through the picture uh, and see the various things you want to see. And we click one more, and I think that's the last one. And click one more time. Uh, so leading lines, it's all about pointing the way, uh, directing the viewer to where you, where you want them to see a particular element of the subject uh, of the photo, or sometimes it's just leading them through the image. Doesn't necessarily have to have a single destination uh, or payoff, as I said at the end. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank Any you so much, questions? Greg. I'm going to bring you up full screen right now, and uh, and tell us tell us where we can find you again. Um, so you saw that there on the last slide, uh, images imagesunderfoot.com. Um, so my website's gone under a bit of uh, transition recently. I switched over to WordPress. Finally, got with the um, with the current decade. I had had been on um, created on iWeb, an old Apple program. Uh, so kind of updated. So it's still a little bit of work in progress, but you can find me there. And then there's links there to my Flickr page. If you go into the bio, links to my Flickr page. Uh, if you're into modeling, there's a link to my model mayhem and stuff like that. Um, so that's where you find me. Um, I try to update it occasionally as I take stuff. I haven't taken a lot of photos uh, the last two years. I had major heart surgery last year, so that put a big, big damper on my photo excursions. Um, so I was really geared up for this year to go out and explore Colorado, my new home, and take lots of photos and really update my portfolio. Uh, and then this wonderful pandemic happened and closed down everything um, or made me fearful to be around groups of people at all these popular parks. Um, so hoping to next year to get out and get some new material um, and, and really uh, find some new exciting places here in Colorado. And I've linked your website. I've linked your website into the chat. Now we have a, a question from Scott. Uh, what are photographers? Uh, who are photographers you admire or have influenced you? Um, so there, there's been several. I wouldn't say I have one like master photographer that that's really sticks out to me. Um, one of the early ones I gravitated uh, towards was uh, Andre Cortez. He's a, a Hungarian photographer. Well, born in Hungary. Um, and he got some success um, in Hungary uh, with his early photography. And then he moved uh, to Paris. Uh, he spent a number of years in Paris and he was pretty successful um, in Paris. Uh, he did a lot of street scenes, um, did some architecture, kind of just, you know, just observing the world. And that's what I kind of liked uh, about his stuff. It's not, I mean, it's back from the 1920s, 1930s, not heavily processed because it's really just a sheet of film and then, you know, whatever dodging and burning he did in the print. Um, but I really kind of like this approach. But what I really like the most about Andre Cortez, and, and I can send you these names later, um, what I like about him most is his story, is that he was this 
he came from Hungary, as I mentioned. Uh, he moved to Paris. He's he's pretty successful uh, in a bunch of galleries and stuff like that. And then he decided to move to New York. He thought, wow, New York's got these great museums, uh, you know, kind of center of the art world of the Americas. And so he moved to uh, New York, thinking that would just really continue to accelerate his career. And it didn't. Um, the art world in New York just didn't accept him for whatever reason. Um, his work, he had a hard time getting his work exhibited, uh, you know, getting commissions and contracts and stuff like that to go take photos. Um, and he's really kind of distraught by it all. And he went in to do a bunch of commercial work. And so he worked for Harper's Bazaar and Vogue and did some kind of you know, more kind of, not cliche, but more kind of commercial work, right? He's trying to sell it. And he really got away from his artistry. And that really frustrated him, but the bill, it was paying the bills, uh, working for major publications like those two. Uh, it paid the bills um, and he still got to do the thing he loved, photography, but it really he felt his soul wasn't in it. And I really resonate with that because I find that I am kind of at that, that point. I, you know, I, I spent the, you know, the first years of my photography life you know, learning the skills and learning the techniques and building my equipment and all that stuff. Um, and then I kind of started developing my style and finding the things I like to photograph the most. But I kind of feel like I'm a bit stagnant now. I'm, I feel like I, I'm yearning for a new challenge. I'm, I'm, my, my heart isn't into some of my photos. I feel like I still take good, competent photos, um, but the, my soul is not in it. And so Andre Cortez was at this uh, same point in his life. And so he said, you know, if, if I'm having problems here in New York, I need to go back to somewhere where my soul can be fulfilled. And so he took a trip back to Paris and he spent a couple of years back in Paris and it rejuvenated his, his love for photography. His soul came back into it. He um, got a bunch of uh, stuff exhibited and stuff there. And then when he came back to America after a few years, he all of a sudden was accepted by the community, uh, the art community, and he became kind of famous again. And uh, he was one of the first photographers to get a Polaroid camera. Uh, so Polaroid sent him a camera to experiment with this new, new age of film. Um, so clearly accepted. And so that just that story resonated with me about sometimes we get stagnant. We, we, we find that we're just, our heart isn't in it. And so when you get to those kinds of road points, and there could be multiple times in your photography or artistic life, that go find a way to reconnect with what, what you really fell in love with, with photography. Um, so that's really one of my, from a story as well as artistry, um, I really resonate with. Uh, Vivian Meyer is another one that resonates with me. And if you, if you haven't heard of her, she was a, a nanny who just always carried a camera and she's always taking pictures. Um, and when she died, she died pretty poor and penniless. And uh, her storage locker went up for auction and someone came across all these negatives as well as un, un, um, undeveloped rolls of film. And as they started to look through the work, they realized that she was really a phenomenal photographer. They've since investigated her and found out she she had some she received some training along the way and definitely studied um, some of the the masters at going to museums in New York and Chicago, um, but she's pretty much self taught. And the one thing I got from her story, and if you you can Google her her work VivianMeyer.com or or just Google uh, Nan Nanny who took photos, um, you can find some of the movies and stuffs out there. What resonated with me with her work is I like her work. And I don't do a lot of street photography, which is all that she did. But I like the idea that she took all these photos and she barely printed any of them. She printed a few herself. She'd make some contact sheets from the, the local camera shop. But for her, it was apparently all about taking the photo. That was the whole experience for her. She didn't feel a need to print them out and hang them out, hang them up around the, the homes that she was living in or, or share them with other people. Um, and I think through some memoirs and some stuff she's left behind, she recognized that she was a talented photographer and she had a, a good viewpoint, but for her, it was all about taking the image. And I think for me, uh, since I mentioned, I take a lot of abstracts and stuff like that, that aren't necessarily mass appeal for a lot of people. Um, even some of the fine art nudes I do, that's, there's no market really for those out there, but I get some enjoyment out of taking those photos. And so I constantly question myself, can I be like Vivian Meyer? Can, 
the art of taking the photo, of capturing the image, capturing the composition, can that be fulfillment in itself? Do I need to sell the image? Do I need to be able to display the image to feel validated that I'm a, a good photographer and that I've you know, kind of shared my viewpoint? So those are two I'd highlight, um, more so I guess for their stories than their actual work. Okay, we have uh, we have one more question. Uh, actually, uh, okay, yeah. Mary Lou asks if you had only you could only use only one lens. What lens would it be? Mm. Well, uh, I I unfortunately, like I said, have a lot of lenses and I carry a lot of lenses with me. But really, I use my twenty four to seventy most of the time on a full frame camera. Um, it's, it's good having a zoom zoom feature. It's definitely wide, 24 millimeters on a full frame camera. It's plenty wide for the stuff I do. I don't do a lot of landscapes and I do occasional panos, but not, not to any frequency. Um, I do like getting close to things and I, I used to really use my macro lens a lot, but now I find that I just really just not necessarily macro, but just focusing in on subjects and getting close ups. And with a 24 to 70 and being able to use my foot zoom, right? Use my feet and clo closer to the subject um, seems to be um, sufficient for me. So I'd say bulk of my photos these days use that lens, even though I'm always carrying multiple other wide angles and zooms with me. I just, I get lazy, really. I don't want to switch out the other one and I'll, I'll just make do with what I have in front of me. Well, let's take this one step further. Let's say you've got your camera, you've got your lens. What is that one piece of kit you've you've just have to have with you every time? Oh, let's see. Maybe a, um, maybe a light meter, maybe a cable release. What's so the gotta have? I'd say the one thing I carry with me all the time is um, a I have a diffusion reflector dish. So it's uh, one of these collapsible circular ones. Um, so it collapses down to about the size of a maybe a dinner plate, about eight ten inches. Uh, but expands out to, I think, 20, 21 inches. Um, so it's a diffuser, diffuser by itself, uh, but then I have a cover that I can slide over it that one side's silver, one side's gold, so I can use that as a reflector. Um, so I find that I carry that with me all the time. Even when I switch out to my very small um, shoulder bag where I'm just bringing my one camera, my one lens, I always think, well, maybe sometimes I want to bounce a little light into a subject, or if I'm taking a a macro or close-up shot, something's in the shade. I, I might need to diffuse light or bounce some light in. So I'm always just um, strapping that to a carabiner and to the outside of my bag. Um, my bigger bag, it goes right in it, but my smaller bags, I strap it to the outside. So I'd say that's kind of one thing I carry with me all the time, but that's because I'm always doing kind of close-up stuff and a lot of times available light and maybe not the most optimal times. Because a lot of times I'm, a lot of these photos are taking them out with my families, you know, they don't like going hiking at 7 a.m. They like going hiking at you know 10:30 a.m. Um, so I'm trying to find you know shaded light and then bounce some light into it to illuminate my subject. So I find that to be really helpful. Okay, uh, another question, and this one's from me, especially with your okay. surgery last year and COVID this year. How have you kept yourself trying to to keep yourself uh, motivated? If you're not going out and, photo, and photographing things, are you photographing things around the house? Are you revisiting old albums? Um, so that, that's, that's that, interesting you ask that question because I, I definitely have done a poor job on it. So uh, I will tell you what I did and then tell you don't do what Greg did because I, I have, uh, from a creative standpoint, I've definitely been in a creative slump. I have a stockpile of doodads and get gizmos and different things around the house that I say, Oh, when I'm snowed in or when I'm stuck at home, I may do a, a macro shoot with that, or I may do a close up, whatever with that. And I haven't done it. I just, I haven't been motivated to do it. Um, so I, I constantly collect like interesting bottles or interesting seashells. And um, my, my wife keeps saying no more space. Like you have to keep this all contained to your little bit of the closet. <laughs> um, so, so I aspire to do those things, but I, I'm bad at it. Um, the one thing I think I have done is I've increased my book collection. Um, my bookshelf is, is continuing to overflow uh, with books. And so I'm, I guess I'm constantly looking online and looking for different photographers or different friends mention a photographer to me or a couple of different blogs I follow or Facebook pages I follow to mention a photographer I haven't heard of. 
you know, get me digging. And then my next stop is, okay, Amazon Prime, what kind of used book can I find? Or I have a couple of used book uh, websites I'll go to, or there's a couple of used book bookstores here in Colorado I found they're pretty decent, have a good uh, photography collection. One of the best ones I ever found is actually in Maryland, in, over in Rockville, uh, where I used to live, called Second Second Story Books or something like that. Mm. Um, but so that's one of the things, it's just uh, studying other photographers, uh, trying to find new inspirations uh, for my work. That's great. Uh, well, I don't have any other questions, so let's put a, a last call in. For questions, okay. and I think we're about, uh, you know, Facebook typically hits around 20 to 30 second delay. Okay. But in, in closing, Greg, any anything, any thoughts? Um, I mean, really just like I was kind of emphasizing in my presentation that, you know, there's all these, these rules and these guides and stuff out there and leading lines is, you know, definitely one of those. And they're great to learn and, and try to see how to apply them in your photography. But in the end, you need to be happy with the photo. It, the photo, unless you're being on, on some paid assignment for National Geographic, which none of us probably are, um, unless you're on some paid assignment to photograph something specifically, most of us are just, this is a hobby. This is something we get joy out of. It's a passion. And so much like the story of Andre Cortez, you know, if your soul is not in it, if your passion is not in it, if you're following all the rules and doing all the focus stacking and all the right things that you're supposed to do, but you're not enjoying the end product is not giving you joy. Even if you get a first place ribbon or, you know, you get a few Facebook likes uh, when you post something, if, if your heart's not in it, then I, I'd say you're doing it wrong. Um, so, you know, if you love the technical, if you love following the leading lines and that works for you, that brings you joy. Great. You know, go do that. But if that's not bringing you joy and you're just using aspects of that, like I showed in a lot of my photos to, extrapolate into kind of adjacent uh, field um, and that brings you joy, go do that. Um, you spend a lot of time and money learning this stuff and, and investing in this gear. And if you're not, if your heart's not in it, change your direction, re reboot or, or go study someone else and get a new perspective or try something new. That's great. Greg, we don't have any other questions. I want to thank you so much for uh, for being here with us and and sharing uh, sharing your fantastic presentation with us. A lot of thank yous in the chat as well. I'm Great, gonna, thank I'm, you. I'm Thanks gonna, again for the invite. Appreciate it. I'm going to keep you on here. I'm just going to bring up our our schedule up really quick and make sure that we go over that. Uh, uh, just a reminder: we went over the the the, the full schedule uh, early in the in the stream, but I just want to give you a reminder that uh, that next week is our open theme contest. And uh, Lewis has sent me an email saying that the, the deadline is going to be 12 noon on Tuesday, November 17th. Remember, this is an open theme. And uh, we also have our Brian Baru fundraiser night, which is on Thursday. And we hope to uh, we hope everybody gets out there and uh, safely can get out there and help support the club. Thanks again so much, uh, so much, Greg. And uh, we will we will see everybody next week. Great. And I put in the chat, there's two photographers I was mentioning, Vivian Meyer and Andre Cortez. I will send, I will post that over to the Facebook group. Let me bring up our, uh, our endings, ending credits and hold on one second there, Greg. Good night, everybody. Right.